Good evening, everyone, and welcome to KAIPAC's public lectures. We are delighted to have you here to discover the universe with us. I'm Alex Amon. I'm a Kavli Fellow at Stanford. Uh, and tonight you'll be hearing about the Hubble Space Telescope, because this year we're celebrating the 30th anniversary since this telescope was launched into space. So Dan Wilkins is going to tell us about some of the ups and downs in getting this telescope into orbit and the re revolutionary images that it sent back to Earth. So Dan is a research scientist uh, at the Kavli Institute for Particle Physics and Astrophysics and Cosmology here at Stanford. His research focuses on supermassive black holes, so these monsters that live at the center of our galaxies and how the matter plunging into them powers some of the most extreme objects that we see in the universe, and that plays a really important role in the formation of the universe as we know it today. So Dan received his doctorate in astronomy from the University of Cambridge in 2009, then held a research fellowship at Halifax, Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia and then an Einstein Fellowship brought him here to us at Stanford in 2016. So having spent much of his time working towards how to communicate science to the public, I have no doubts that you're in, an absolute, in for an absolute treat tonight when you hear from him. So for those of us on Zoom, head to the bottom. Um, there's a Q&A button if you'd like to ask any questions. And if you're on YouTube, feel free to post questions in the chat. Dan, take us away. Well, thank you very much, Alex. It is a great pleasure to be able to join you tonight and to tell you about really some of the remarkable achievements of the Hubble Space Telescope. Let's see if I can get my slides up first of all. So a lot has happened in 2020, I think it's fair to say, but as Alex said, just one of the very many events this year is actually the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. So I thought I'd join you tonight to share with you the remarkable story of Hubble, how it came to be and how it got into orbit and some of the amazing science and the amazing images that we've obtained from Hubble that have really revolutionized our study of astronomy. So of course, to start this story, we have to answer the question, why would we put a telescope into space in the first place? Well, the short answer to that is the Earth's atmosphere. Now the atmosphere is absolutely vital for our life here on Earth. It provides the oxygen that we breathe and it protects us from the harsh environment and the radiation that comes from outer space. But sometimes as astronomers, we wish the atmosphere wasn't there because it gets in our way in a number of ways. Now you've probably heard the adage, twinkle, twinkle, little star, and the nursery rhyme with the same name. Well, what exactly does that mean, twinkle, twinkle, little star? Well, the light that comes from the stars and the galaxies and the universe that we look at has to pass through the Earth's atmosphere in order to reach us. But the air in the atmosphere is always in motion. So if I have a star that I'm trying to look at the light from, and a slightly more dense patch of atmosphere comes through, maybe a gust of wind blows, the light from that star is going to get bent or refracted as it passes through these changes in the air pressure in the atmosphere. So instead of the true location of the star being seen, it's going to look like the star is over here. If we trace that ray of light back in the direction that it seemed to come from. So as this little bit of atmosphere moves underneath the star, the apparent position of the star in the sky moves just a little bit. And now imagine an even higher pressure part of the atmosphere comes in. Well, this might cause the light to bend even more. So the star now appears to have moved again. And when we were trying to observe the stars, we're taking long exposure photographs with the cameras on the back of our telescopes. A long exposure photograph that's needed because the light coming from many of these objects is so faint that we just need time to collect enough of it. So with this star always appearing to be in motion because of the moving atmosphere, it means images such as this, the M15, globular cluster of stars and the cat's eye nebula appear blurred out as the atmosphere 
moves their apparent positions on the sky. But if we could somehow get our telescopes up above the Earth's atmosphere, we might be able to get around this blurring of our images that limits the detail to which we can study the universe. These aren't new ideas at all. The idea of a space telescope can actually be traced back to the German scientist and engineer Hermann Oberth in 1923, when he wrote his doctoral thesis with well, the English translation of the name, The Rocket Interplanetary Space Flight. And he published a later book, Mankind Into Space in 1953, where he outlined ideas of putting refracting telescopes up in atmosphere, up in orbit above the Earth's atmosphere. And in the United States, the really transformative publications on the idea of space telescopes were published by Lyman Spitzer. In particular, Spitzer published a paper called Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory all the way back in 1946. And in the 1960s, Spitzer lobbied the United States Congress for the funding that was required to pursue this idea of a telescope in orbit around the Earth. Congress approved these plans and the design study started in 1973. But with a big project such as this, it's typical that a single country doesn't have the resources on its own to pursue it. So the European Space Agency joined this study two years later in 1975. But the problem in the 1970s was that there were a number of technological gaps that just made a space-based telescope unfeasible. We needed new technology. The first problem was how to deliver such a large and complicated telescope safely into orbit and get it functioning in orbit. And the second problem with putting a telescope in orbit was how to get the images that it captures back to Earth. Because in the 1970s and before, telescopes didn't have digital cameras as we're used to today. In the 1970s, telescopes used photographic plates, just like photographic film in a camera, but on a rigid glass plate. So a light sensitive plate that darkens when light hits it. This was the only way really of recording images back then. And there were even crazy ideas they came up with, such as having the space telescope drop these photographic plates back to earth and have them fall under parachutes. But this really wasn't going to be a viable solution in the long term for a space-based telescope. But fortunately in the 1970s, there were two big technological transformations that came along. The first one was NASA's space shuttle program. This design study began in 1972 and it ran up until the first shuttle flight in 1981. And the shuttle provided the first big breakthrough that was required for the space telescope program. The space shuttle delivered two key capabilities. The first one, the shuttle is able to lift large payloads into orbit, so it can safely deliver a large and complex telescope. Astronauts could also fly up with the telescope and aid its delivery and travel back to the telescope and service it so that it can remain state of the art. But the problem still remained of how to get the images from this space telescope back to Earth. Well, that breakthrough came by accident in the early 1980s by engineers working at IBM. They were researching a new type of computer memory. Now, this new type of memory they were working on turned out to be incredibly sensitive to light. Now, this isn't very good if you want computer memory. If you shine light on your memory chips, you can completely change what's stored in it. But it turns out that these devices that today we know as charge couple devices or CCDs for short, while they're no good at storing data, they are extremely good at recording the pattern of light that makes contact with them. So the way this charge coupled device works, it's a layer of the semiconductor material, silicon. When light comes in and hits the silicon, it knocked subatomic particles called electrons off of the atoms. And these electrons get trapped in a layer of this silicon, and this creates an electrical voltage. 
So this silicon produces an electrical signal in response to the light that comes in and hits it. And we divide up the silicon into what we call pixels or picture elements. So we have an array of different pixels, a number of different pieces. So when the light comes in, knocking off those electrons and producing that electrical signal, we can see from this grid whereabouts the light hit. So you could imagine the light coming in and forming its image on this grid of silicon. Then once we've exposed this CCD to the light to record the image for however long we need to gather enough light, we can then apply electrical signals onto these pixels. And that causes the signal that's been stored in each pixel to be shuffled along from one pixel to the next. So after we've recorded the image, we shuffle those electrical signals down to one end of the device, and then we run them through an amplifier. And it's that amplifier that stores the image and reconstructs the image that the detector saw. And these charge couple devices or CCDs are exactly the same types of detector that we have in digital cameras, in webcams, even in cell phones commonly today. So with these two technological breakthroughs and years of design study, in 1985, it was finally finished, the Hubble Space Telescope, 13 meters long and 12.5 tons in weight. And crucially, Hubble has a modular design, so different parts of it can be upgraded or replaced as required when it's serviced over the life of the mission. Hubble has two large solar panels with thousands of solar cells that charge up the batteries that power it. And it has an antenna on the top and another antenna sticking out the bottom. This allows it to receive commands that we send to it from Earth, telling it which way to point, what to look at, how to record the images. And it's the same antennae that download the images and the data that the telescope records to Earth. But other than being in orbit, essentially a satellite, Hubble is kind of the same design as what we call a Cassegrain telescope that we put on the Earth. So there's an opening at the front of the telescope here. This is the way the light comes in, and it has this aperture door that we can close to protect it. The light comes in, travels all the way down this tube until it reaches this primary mirror, this dark blue disc in the image. This primary mirror collects the light coming in, it focuses it and sends it to a secondary mirror that sits here in the middle. And then that secondary mirror sends it back down through a hole in the middle of the primary mirror into these four devices at the back and then one extra device sticking out the side. And these five devices in total are the different cameras and instruments that record the images. I'll come back to the details of those cameras and instruments in a few moments time. But there's a few other things here. There's these things called support systems. So this is an array of computers that control the telescope, the memory that records the data, and sensors called gyroscopes that let us point it and keep it pointing in the right direction. And then it has these devices called fine guidance sensors. These are these boxes around the main instruments. And each of the fine guidance sensors is a small telescope. These telescopes are essentially stargazers or celestial navigators. They look at the known constellations of stars in the sky. And by looking for the constellations, the patterns of stars that we know about, that's how the computer on board the telescope knows what it's looking at and knows which way it's pointing. But these computerized fine guidance sensors are 10 times more accurate than an astronomer sitting on the ground can achieve. Here's a picture of the primary mirror with some engineers stood next to it for scale. It's 2.4 meters across and you can see that disc in the middle which is where that pops out and that's where the hole is that the light travels through to get to the cameras. Now the original design for the Hubble Space Telescope was to have a three meter mirror. But unfortunately, one of the biggest challenges we face when we launch any spacecraft is the weight 
or the mass. The more massive your spacecraft is, the more fuel you need to get it off the ground and the more challenging it is to get it off the ground. So as your spacecraft gets bigger and heavier, it becomes a lot more expensive to launch. So unfortunately, that three meter mirror had to be scaled down to 2.4 meters. And Hubble was specifically designed to be launched on the space shuttle. Here's a picture of it. This is Hubble Space Telescope sitting in the cargo bay or ready to be loaded into the cargo bay of one of the space shuttles. Now, Hubble was originally planned to be launched in 1983, but it was nowhere near ready. So the launch was put back to 1986 after it was completed in 1985. But following the unfortunate Challenger disaster, the launch of Hubble was postponed indefinitely. The tragic loss of the Challenger spacecraft with the astronauts on board led to a serious redesign of many components of the space shuttle program. The space shuttle after 1986 had to go through a number of modifications to make it safe to fly again which meant launch could finally be rescheduled for the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990. They got to the launch pad, they began the countdown, but at T minus four minutes, they had to abort the launch again at the last minute because there'd been a failure in the orbiter's power supply system. But finally, on the 24th of April, 1990, mission STS-31, of the Discovery Space Shuttle finally carried the Hubble Space Telescope into orbit. And as noted by the NASA launch commentator, we have liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. Now here's a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope being launched out of the cargo bay of Discovery. It was launched using the robotic arm, in particular the Canada arm, 350 miles above the Earth, and that places it in an orbit that takes 95 minutes to complete. So the Hubble Space Telescope completes one trip around the Earth once every 95 minutes. Now this moment when you release your new telescope or your new satellite into its orbit from the launch vehicle is absolutely critical. So at this point, we need to very carefully unfold the various components, unfold the solar panels, open up the doors and gradually power up the systems one by one. And Hubble faced more challenges. At first, one of its solar panels got jammed and failed to unfold. And there were two astronauts who were ready to conduct what's called an EVA, an extravehicular activity when they leave the shuttle. And essentially they go and hit it with a hammer to free the, to free the solar panel. But luckily, just before those astronauts had to go outside, they managed to get the door, get the solar panel open. Then two days later, it took them two tries to get that aperture door covering up the front of the telescope to open. But finally, the commentator was able to pronounce that Discovery Hubble is open for business. Then for the first two weeks after its launch, the engineers put the spacecraft through a rigorous program of tests. The various bits of equipment and the computer systems were powered up one by one, and each one was thoroughly tested to make sure that it was functioning properly. And then finally, we get to the stage we call first light, the first real image of a star that we capture with the telescope. The first light for Hubble was on the 20th of May, 1990, and it was of an open star cluster called NGC 3532. But something was wrong. This was the first image from the wide field and planetary camera on Hubble. But you can see it's blurred. The Hubble Space Telescope wasn't focusing properly. It turns out that the mirror had ever so slightly the wrong shape. It was two thousandths of a millimeter off, and this hadn't been detected in the testing. It was an error made in the manufacturing of the mirror. Now, this was a huge embarrassment for NASA. 
course, the press had a field day with this. The New York Post ran the headline, Picks Nixed as Hubble Sees Double. Newsweek called this NASA's $1.5 billion blunder. And the cartoonists had their fun as well. You can see Hubble here at the optometrists and with a pair of glasses. But the scientists working on Hubble really needed to find a way to salvage this 1.5 billion project. So the first idea was to try and correct the light that's bouncing off the mirror. Computer experts devised a way to manipulate the data that's coming in to reconstruct how the image should be. The idea being that if you know a star produces this pattern, based on the blurring you can see, you can kind of work backwards to reconstruct how the image should look. And when this was combined with the longest exposures, this produced okay images, but it was no better than we could achieve with telescopes on the ground. So what can we do about it? Could NASA bring Hubble back to Earth? Absolutely not. Bringing Hubble back down is far too expensive and far too risky. If anything, Hubble had to be fixed while it was in orbit. By 1993, not only did Hubble have bad optics, struggling for three years, but three out of the six gyroscopes it needs to stay pointed in the right direction on the sky had failed. So this means it had started losing its ability to track the stars and the galaxies and the objects it was looking at. Its solar panels were vibrating, which meant the images were wobbling, and two of the computer memory banks on board had failed. So this meant three years after launch, Hubble was on the verge of becoming useless. So there was nothing for it but to fix Hubble in orbit. And the fix was this device. This is called CoStar. And if you remember those four image bays I showed at the back, those four modules where the cameras sit, CoStar replaces one of those cameras behind the telescope. And CoStar is a system of 10 small mirrors to refocus and correct the light coming in. It's basically a pair of glasses for Hubble. But the downside for this was that one of those five different cameras that provided a vast range of capabilities to Hubble had to be removed to make space for it. And on the 2nd of December, 1993, the Space Shuttle Endeavour launched on mission STS-61, carrying CoStar and some astronauts to do that first servicing mission on the Hubble Space Telescope. On December 5th, astronauts spent eight hours replacing the gyroscopes that had failed, the computer memory banks and other electronics on board. And then on December 6th, they installed that CoStar module and they replaced actually the wide field and planetary camera with an upgraded version called the wide field and planetary camera version two. The total EVA time, the amount of time the astronauts spent working outside on the Hubble was 35 hours. And at the time, this was a new record for the longest EVA that had ever been conducted by astronauts. But on December 9th, they were finished Hubble was lifted back out of the shuttle's cargo bay and back into orbit. So let's try this whole first light thing again. Second first light was on December 18th, 1993, looking at a star called Melnik 34, which is a bright star in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And you can see that Hubble had been fixed. It was focusing perfectly. And then, they tried to look at something a little more complicated. So this is the Tarantula Nebula, 30 Doradus. You can see that Hubble was working perfectly. Between 1993 and 2008, the space shuttle fleet conducted a total of five servicing missions to replace parts that have become damaged or worn out over time. In particular, those gyroscopes that keep it pointed in the right direction and the batteries are the components that tend to fail in the harsh environment of space. On these visits as well, 
They replaced and upgraded a number of the instruments and the computer systems to keep the Hubble Space Telescope state of the art. And the other thing with the Hubble Space Telescope is it's actually in quite a low orbit around the Earth. It's not quite above the Earth's atmosphere. It flies through the very top layers of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, the air is very thin up there but it's just enough to slow the telescope down, which means it slowly falls back to Earth. So each of the servicing missions would push Hubble back up a little bit higher to delay its fall back to Earth. But unfortunately, with the retirement of the space shuttle fleet, STS-125, that Atlantis mission, was the last servicing mission to Hubble. You can see it had by far the longest list of services. It had five new instruments put in, as well as replacing all the gyroscopes, the protective outer blanket, the batteries, those fine guidance sensors that keep it pointing in the right direction to keep Hubble running as long as possible. But unfortunately, with no more pushes back up to our higher orbit, over the next 10 years or so, Hubble is going to gradually fall back towards Earth and it won't stay in orbit forever. Here's just a couple of last photographs of those cameras and instruments being replaced. This is a spectrograph and this is a camera. And today Hubble has five different instruments that we can think of as cameras inside. This is one of them that fits into one of those four locations at the back. This is the Advanced Camera for Surveys, or ACS. It has a wide field of view that lets us look at the large scale distribution of galaxies across the universe, but it also has a high resolution channel for zooming in on the inner parts of distant galaxies and for searching for planets around other stars. And it doesn't just look in the visible light that our eyes can see, it can also see ultraviolet light for studying weather on the planets in our solar system. This is the wide field camera version three, and you can see this one has a slightly different shape because this doesn't fit into one of those four bays at the back, it fits into a radial bay out the side. The wide field camera is for taking high resolution images of extremely large fields on the sky. And this is a device called the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. This isn't a camera in the conventional sense. It doesn't record an image. Rather, it splits the incoming light into different colors. Just like when light passes through a raindrop or through a prism, it separates into the colors that make it up. This device separates the light into different colors and it lets us see the colors that are emitted by specific chemical elements. So by using this instrument, we can see not only the shapes of galaxies and, the, and images of stars and planets, but we can measure the amount of different chemicals that make up their composition. And by measuring the very subtle shifts in the colors of light, we can measure something called redshift that tells us how quickly galaxies are moving away and it lets us measure the expansion of the universe. So how exactly do we get these images? Well, the secret of these beautiful astronomical images that you see is that the cameras on board don't directly produce the spectrum of colors that we're used to seeing. Instead, we have monochrome cameras and in front of those cameras, we put in different filters, filters that pick out very specific colors. So you can either have red filters, green filters, blue filters, or we can have more specific filters that only show the light coming from specific chemical elements. With each of these filters, we're able to capture a black and white image, but a black and white image that just corresponds to the brightness of those specific colors we're filtering. Those images are stored in the onboard memory banks, and when Hubble flies over one of the ground stations, it then downloads the images and the data it's captured to our computer systems on Earth, where they're stored in vast archives at the Space, Science, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. And from there, they're distributed to the astronomers around the world who analyze these images, analyze these data, 
and use them to learn about what we're looking at. So when astronomers, we receive these images, we take these black and white images that correspond to those very specific colors. And to produce those beautiful images that we see, we mix them together. And we assign to each of these colors a different false color. So in this case, the light coming from sulfur, we put in red. The light coming from hydrogen, we put in green. And the light coming from oxygen, we put in blue. And then we adjust the contrast and the levels of each of these colors to bring out the different features. And that produces these images that we've become so used to seeing from Hubble. Well, for over 30 years now, apart from an occasional downtime for faults and the servicing missions, Hubble has been observing the skies 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in that time, it has amassed a wealth of stunning images of a vast collection of heavenly bodies. We see many, many stars. We see stars forming in clusters from enormous clouds of gas. What we can see in this image is brand new stars that form as a cloud of gas collapses under the force of gravity. And then these new stars form out of that cloud. And then these young hot stars actually evaporate away the clouds they form in, clearing out this cavity that we can see. As well as looking at visible light, Hubble can also see infrared light and ultraviolet light. And with infrared, we can see straight through all of that dust in the cloud. So this is the Horsehead Nebula, but seen in infrared light. And we can see through the cloud of gas to see the young stars forming inside. And one of the most famous images of star formation from Hubble comes from the Eagle Nebula in the constellation of Serpens. If we zoom in, on this structure in the center of the eagle. You can kind of see the head of the eagle here and the wings, but we're gonna zoom in on this structure that looks like the eagle's claws. These are the pillars of creation. These are giant clouds of gas, so big that it takes light seven years to travel from one side of one of these pillars to the other. One of those tiny little fingers sticking out the top barely visible on this image, is bigger than our entire solar system. But these are giant pillars of gas, clouds of gas that are growing new stars. At the other end of the spectrum with the ultraviolet light, this shows us the really hot young stars. So by looking at the Andromeda galaxy in not visible light, but ultraviolet light, we see the patches, the regions of the galaxy where new stars are currently growing. And we can see these spectacular objects called starburst galaxies. This is a galaxy called M82 or the Cigar Galaxy. And as well as the disk of the galaxy across the center, we see these plumes that the galaxy is spitting out. This galaxy is very rapidly forming new stars in its center. And all these new stars are driving out these massive plumes of gas. At the other end of the life cycle of stars, we start to see their deaths. When stars die, they expel vast quantities of gas, producing these beautiful planetary nebulae. This is the Butterfly Nebula. And this is another planetary nebula called NGC 5189 that kind of looks like something you could hang on your Christmas tree. Now, all of these stars and these planetary nebulae we've seen are within our own galaxy. But of course, Hubble has given us some of the closest views of those distant galaxies right across the universe. Take the Pinwheel Galaxy. The images we're able to capture at high resolution let us separate out this galaxy into the groups of stars that make it up. And we can work out how these galaxies must have been put together as the structure in our universe formed. And we can even see these complicated results of a collision between two giant galaxies. We think an image like this comes about when two of those spiral galaxies collide with one another.
and we can even study black holes. The Hubble Space Telescope gives us a unique view of supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. Hubble's census of galaxies shows us that most galaxies host a supermassive black hole in their nucleus, and that the size of the black hole in the center of a galaxy is very closely related to the overall size of the galaxy. This is a profound result. It tells us that black holes grew along with the galaxies they live in, and the black hole in the center of a galaxy must have played an important role in forming that galaxy. And the Hubble Space Telescope is able to zoom in on the centers of galaxies to see the disks of dust that will eventually fall into that black hole and that fuel the incredibly bright sources of light that supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies are able to power. Hubble was also able to zoom in on the impressive jet launched by the supermassive black hole in the center of M87. M87 is an elliptical galaxy. You can see the stars as this diffuse light, but something in the nucleus of this galaxy is launching a jet at almost the speed of light that's traveling far out of the galaxy. And with the Hubble Space Telescope, we're able to see the structures and the knots within the jet that can teach us about how the jet is accelerated and just how this black hole tiny in relation to the size of the galaxy, is able to launch a jet much, much bigger than the whole galaxy. And Hubble has given us spectacular close-ups of the outer planets in our own solar system, such as this image of Jupiter, with its moon Ganymede just peeking out from behind. Hubble has studied changes to the Great Red Spot, this is a giant storm the size of the planet Earth, and it's even witnessed asteroids and fragments of comets crashing into the surface of Jupiter. And beyond our own solar system, Hubble has been able to study exoplanets, planets around stars beyond our own solar system. Now, when Hubble launched in 1990, we were yet to find any planets beyond our own solar system. But measurements with the Hubble Space Telescope allowed for the first studies of the chemical compositions of the atmospheres of exoplanets. And Hubble between 2004 and 2012 captured this series of images of a system called Fomalhaut B. If we zoom in on this region here of this disk of debris that's left over after a star forms, so the star here is in the center and it's been blotted out by a disc within the instrument. So the star doesn't saturate our image. But around this star is a disc of debris that's left over from the formation of the star. And the Hubble Space Telescope was able to zoom in on this region here. And it saw this tiny speck of light that had moved from 2004 to six to 10 to 2012. And this tiny speck of light might be one of the first images we've captured of a young planet that's growing in the disk of debris left over from the formation of a new star. The Hubble Space Telescope has produced more than 500,000 images of more than 25,000 celestial bodies. And these have led to more than 7,000 scientific publications, a lasting scientific legacy. But anybody can use Hubble. One of the deals of using taxpayer money to fund such a large mission as the Hubble Space Telescope means that the data that are captured by Hubble are available to everybody on the internet. So if anybody wants to use the Hubble Space Telescope to look at something, what we have to do is write a proposal that explains why that's interesting. And that will be judged by a committee of scientists who will then decide how much of Hubble's valuable time to allocate to different projects. 
And then after an astronomer has asked for time to look at something, the data is what we call proprietary. So only the group that asked for it are able to use that data for a year after it's taken. But then after one year, all of the data from Hubble is made public on the internet. Now you need a little bit of know-how about how to analyze this data and how to extract the specialist file formats that it's stored in. But in principle, all of these remarkable Hubble Im images are available to the public. Now Hubble has been a fantastic observatory. It has observed everything from stars to galaxies to planets and black holes. But one of Hubble's most important scientific contributions has been what's called its key project. Now, whenever we design a big space mission, we have a particular project in mind. Even though it'll do lots of science, we always design a mission with a key project in mind to make sure there's something it's guaranteed to achieve. And the key project of the Hubble Space Telescope was to build on the pioneering work of its namesake, Edwin Hubble, who in the 1930s discovered, along with others, that when we look at distant galaxies, they move away from us. And that the more distant a galaxy is, the faster it moves away from us. And it's this that tells us that the universe we live in isn't static, but the universe we live in is expanding. So Hubble's key project was to measure the expansion of the universe. And one of the ways it does this is with a certain type of supernova explosion called a type 1a supernova. And this is what happens when you have a stellar remnant called a white dwarf that a star like our sun will leave at the end of its life in orbit around a companion star. And if that white dwarf tries to grow too much by pulling in gas from its companion star, it can explode. And it turns out that all of these supernovae, these type 1a supernovae, explode by a very similar mechanism, which means that they have the same brightness. Well, they don't quite have the same brightness, but we know enough about them that we can always work out what their brightness should be based on other characteristics we can observe. Now, the great thing about supernovae is they're extremely bright. This is a supernova explosion outshining the whole galaxy that it lives in. So we can see supernovae extremely long ways away in the universe. And because we know how bright these supernovae should be, by seeing how bright they appear, we can work out how far away they are. Because if a light moves further away from us, it appears to be dimmer. This means we can measure the distance to these distant galaxies. And by measuring subtle shifts in the colors of light that are emitted from the chemicals in the stars in these galaxies, we can measure how fast the galaxy is moving. So this is how the Hubble Space Telescope and other observatories are able to use supernova explosions to actually measure how quickly our universe is expanding. And these measurements made by Hubble, along with ground-based observatories, showed that our universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating. So there must be a mysterious force that we call dark energy, and we fully don't understand what this force is. But this mysterious dark energy is pushing space itself apart and causing the expansion of space to speed up. And one of the most remarkable images Hubble has captured was of what was apparently an empty patch of sky in what are known as its deep field images. Hubble was tasked to stare for a very long time, two million seconds, that's 23 days, at a patch of the sky that we thought was blank, so between the galaxies and between the stars that we know about. And given that Hubble costs about $3 per second to operate, staring for two million seconds at what you think is empty space, is quite a big sell to the management, but it really paid off. It captured what's known as the extreme deep field. It found 15,500 faint far away galaxies. And this shows that in our universe, there are, as, there are galaxies as far as the eye can see. Now these galaxies are faint because they're so far away 
that the light from them takes 13.2 billion years to get to us. That means we are seeing these galaxies not as they are today, but as they were 13.2 billion years ago. This light was one third of its way here before the planet Earth even formed. And by comparing these galaxies to the galaxies we see today nearby, we can understand how galaxies grow and how they evolved over the history of the universe. But just quickly before I wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about the future beyond Hubble. So one reason we launch telescopes into space is to get above the atmosphere that's causing the twinkling of stars that blurs out our images. Another reason to get above the atmosphere is there are certain wavelengths of light, light in the general sense, in the electromagnetic spectrum that spans all the way from radio waves to microwaves to infrared, the optical or visible light we can see through to high energy ultraviolet, X-ray or gamma ray light. There are certain wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation that the atmosphere blocks completely. So if you want to look at ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, a lot of microwaves or infrared or certain low frequency radio waves, they also get stopped by the Earth's atmosphere. So if you want to see these wavelengths, you have no choice but to put your observatory up in space. And we have a whole fleet of observatories operating in these different wavelengths, all the way from the microwaves studying the birth of the universe and the cosmic microwave background through to infrared. Hubble sits here looking mostly at optical light, visible light, or the infrared and ultraviolet. But we have a whole fleet of telescopes as well looking at high energy X-rays and gamma rays. And the next ambitious project beyond Hubble is an ambitious flagship space telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope that looks not at visible light, but at infrared light to observe some of the most distant events in our universe and to see the formation of the first galaxies. Its development began in 1996. It's had a few design setbacks, but we're hoping to get it off the ground in October of next year, October 2021. Here is the 6.5 meter mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope in the clean room at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And because infrared is heat, we need to keep this telescope cool so you don't detect the warmth that's coming from your own satellite. So the James Webb Space Telescope sits on top of this sunshade. So you can see that hole in the middle where that mirror is going to stick up from. But we've got a whole timeline of ambitious missions to come. After James Webb launching in 2021, the European Space Agency is planning to launch a mission called Euclid to survey distant galaxies and measure precisely the expansion due to dark energy. There are new X-ray missions, one called CRISM, designed to give a detailed view of hot gas in giant clusters of galaxies and around black holes, planned to launch in 2022. The Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, planned to be launched by NASA in 2025, again looking for that expansion of the universe, but also able to study planets around other stars. A planet hunter called Plato being launched by Europe in 2026. And the Athena Space Telescope, the next flagship X-ray telescope that I'm involved in with colleagues at Stanford, where we're designing some of the electronics that will read out the data coming from its cameras. And perhaps one of the most transformative new space missions is a mission called LISA. LISA which will use a series of lasers in orbit to measure ripples traveling through space itself, the next step in measuring gravitational waves. So while the Hubble Space Telescope might be coming to the end of its life, 
We're hoping to keep it operational for at least the next few years and for it to continue producing spectacular images and amazing insights of our universe. But beyond the Hubble Space Telescope, the future's bright for space astronomy. So I'll stop there. Thank you everyone for joining us and I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Dan. That was fantastic. Um, so everybody, just a reminder to those of you online on Zoom, you can leave your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, and if you're on YouTube, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, so to get us started, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I learned something new. I always thought that the blunder of the Hubble Space Telescope happened during launch. Um, but that makes me mark the, ask the even more remarkable question, which is, how do you contain, <laughs> I, I have no idea how they contained the Hubble Space Telescope well enough to survive that jittery launch and only break <laughs> to one over two, two thousandth of a millimeter. Well, as a, somebody um, who's been involved in space missions, um, I was involved in a Japanese-led mission called Hitomi a couple of years ago. And um, I can tell you that when you're um, tuning in online to watch the launch of this project, it is an absolutely terrifying moment. <laughs> um, and I know many colleagues of mine who've been actually more involved in the management of these missions than I am. Um, people who've staked 20 years of their career on a single observatory or mission then taking it, strapping it to the top of a giant tank of fuel and launching it into <laughs> space. I mean, it's, it's absolutely terrifying, but, um, <laughs> but you trust your engineers. Um, there's a lot of engineering that goes into the rockets. Um, so what we do once we've built the telescope on the ground, um, so once Hubble had been built in the clean room, the next thing you do with it before you put it anywhere near a real rocket is you test it and test it and test it. And um, so we put it in these giant vacuum chambers, we suck all the air out, we heat it up and cool it down to simulate the cold of space and the heat of sunlight. Um, and we put it on these machines called shake tables as well. So we violently shake our telescope in the lab to simulate what it's gonna experience on launch to make sure that there aren't any nuts and bolts that are gonna fall off. Um, so yeah, it's pretty terrifying launching these things, but with careful engineering, you can make sure that it doesn't sustain any damage on launch. Yeah, it's so cool and so impressive. Um, then my other question was, which one is your favorite Hubble Space Telescope image? And that's also a question from somebody in the audience. And my favorite Hubble Space Telescope image, that is a, a really difficult one to pick. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of split between three images for, for different <laughs> reasons. So in terms of just the pure image, one of my favorites is the, the pillars of creation that I showed just seeing those beautiful colors showing all the different chemical elements in that gas and thinking that that gas is seven light years across, much bigger than our solar system. And it's a nursery forming new stars while we watch it. Um, I also really am amazed by the, the deep field image, just seeing how far the universe goes and just how many galaxies there are and thinking that that light was a third of the way here before the planet Earth was even formed is incredible to me. Um, and lastly, I have to say M87 because a lot of my own research is on black holes and how they launch those impressive jets um, and just seeing that beautiful image of the jet from Hubble um, is fantastic. Yeah, I'd agree that there is definitely no shortage of, <laughs> of like wondrous images to pick from. I think the deep field is also my favorite. It just for an image that makes you feel as absolutely small as can possibly be, <laughs> that would be it. Um, one of the questions in the chat is, uh, seems also quite like a remark at the 13.2 billion years. Um, so I guess referring to the age of the, of the galaxies in the Hubble deep field. Do you wanna say a bit more about that? Um, yeah, sure. So, so how do we know exactly where these galaxies are and, um, and that the universe is 13.2 billion years old? Um, well, so what we can do with, with Hubble and with other experiments is um, we can measure the expansion of the universe. And I know Alex can tell you much more about this than I can as, as part of her own research. Um, 
But by measuring how quickly the universe is expanding, what we can do is we can turn the clock backwards. So the expansion of space is when everything in the universe is moving away from everything else. So every galaxy is moving further from every other galaxy. So if you run the clock backwards, we end up with everything moving towards the same small place of the universe. And that point we trace it back to is what we call the Big Bang. And we can work out from how quickly we see it expanding today, along with careful measurements of the, the leftover light from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background, um, and other measurements of the expansion of the universe, we can, we can work out how long it took. Um, so that's how we come up with the number of 13 point. Actually, while well, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, um, we don't quite see the galaxies from the beginning of the universe. We see them from 13.2 billion years ago, just a little bit after the beginning of the universe. Um, and the way we know those galaxies are so far away is because we know how bright galaxies should be near us. And um, so we can work out from how faint they appear, just how far away they are. Cool, yeah. And then one of our audience members designed the coronagraph for the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, fantastic. Um, so do you want to tell us a bit more about um, what you're looking forward to with James Webb compared to Hubble Space Telescope? Um, yeah, I think um, the, Hubble, um, the Hubble Space Telescope has been absolutely transformative. And, um, and I think the first thing to say is that the James Webb Space Telescope is not a direct replacement for Hubble. It will not replace Hubble. Hubble sees visible light, the same light that our eyes can see. James Webb doesn't see that. It sees this longer wavelength infrared light. So we don't see the same processes with James Webb. It will do completely different science. It won't just be the same science, but better. But what we can do with James Webb, and I think one of the things I'm really looking forward to is um, because these galaxies, when they get further away from us, the colors of light they emit get redder and redder and redder. To see really what's going on in those early galaxies and how they, they grew in the early universe, a lot of that information because of that shifting of light is at infrared wavelengths. So James Webb will give us a whole new view of that long wavelength, low energy light to let us see how the galaxies put together. Uh, but of course, it'll do so much more than that. Um, there's a lot it can do to look at black holes feeding in the centers of galaxies. Um, it can find black holes that are hiding in the cloud of gas they're eating from. Imagine a messy eater that's hiding inside its own food supply. Uh, James Webb can help us pinpoint some of those, um, and it will be able to tell us much more about the atmospheres or the compositions of exoplanets than we're able to learn today. Great, thanks. Um, and then I wanted to say one more thing, and I, and I wondered if you knew about this or what your thoughts were. I really like that the Hubble Space Telescope has an Instagram page, and you can just go and see some of the... I, I love that idea that there are the best, some of the best photos that we've ever taken of space. And they just post them for the public to see in a really um, accessible way. Uh, so I don't know if you noticed the one this year that was the coral reef photo. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing um, what, what we can do with Hubble. And I think it's fair to say that it's not just the science that's been transformative with Hubble, but the perception of astronomy to the public. Hubble has produced some of the clearest images we have ever seen of distant objects in the universe. Um, and just being able to share those images with the public. I mean, in the old days, it was through newspapers and magazines, and then it moved to, um, I mean, hubblesite.org remains a fantastic website from, from Hubble. It just has a huge image gallery of all the images that have been taken. Um, and today having Instagram to be able to reach out to people and show people a <laughs> daily astronomical picture. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. And uh, just being able to share this view of the universe with people and just being able to see the universe we live in in a different way. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I loved your talk. The other side of that, which is that people see these beautiful images and, and they are stunning and they do change the way you see the universe. But it's so interesting to hear about the science side of it, what, what we do with these images and what we learn from it. Um, so with that, we'll say thanks, Dan, for your talk and for, um, for your sharing all this knowledge with us. Um, and have a good evening, everyone online. Okay, thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye for now.